Hello, and welcome. Episode 38 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. This is John Denning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. Oh, you lucky turd. How is it? <laughs> <laughs> I like Lake Tahoe, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. I was there. It's funny. I was there almost 12 months to the day. Um, I think I got there on the 31st of last year. Did you? It's being recorded on the 30th. I did. Right. Yeah, I spent last... Uh, we're in slightly different spots, but I spent last New Year's up in Truckee. Yeah. North Tahoe. Uh, great spot. I've got a bunch of friends in Truckee right now, and oftentimes when I go to Tahoe, which isn't that frequent, um, I stay up north. I like squad and skiing up there. Yeah. But this time I had friends down south and I uh, wanted to come meet some people. So went on the south and ended up on the Nevada side. The Nevada. And we know I'm saying that correctly. Get that right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Nevada, it's Nevada. I uh, Yeah, we were lucky enough. I, I was there with the now ex-girlfriend last year um, who immediately gave up on snowboarding. So I was kind of left to my own devices. But we skied, God, we were at North Star, we were at Squaw, we skied Alpine. We were all over the map um, with a, a buddy of mine whose family has a place there. God, it was fun. Such I really like time. Squaw and Alpine, both of those two. That's probably my favorite uh, resort to snowboard at around here. Yeah. Well, my first Tahoe experience, I think you know this, and we won't get too deep into the details, I hope, but it was at um, Heavenly, the mm -hmm. big mountain down right south, right which now. is right, I assume, where you are. Can ski in, ski out. Uh, I did indeed. Skied in and skied out of a lot of things. And it was. <laughs> I think maybe we should leave that alone. Okay. <laughs> but it's a, it's a beautiful place. The, the fact that you can actually ski the, Col or the, the California Nevada, Nevada uh, state line back and it's, forth, back and forth is really cool. It's cool. It's a, one of the cool things about Tahoe, and I think especially where I live in general, is that Tahoe is only three and a half hours from me. As and a drive, yeah. I can turn around and from where I live, get to the beach in about an hour at most. So maybe an hour and 20 minutes, depends on the, the route that I take. But that's one of the great things about California is you get to the beach and the mountains, you can get everywhere pretty quick. Yeah, you know, that's a big part of the reason I'm in California, period. It's because yeah. you just wouldn't shut up about these benefits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're in the middle of LA, you've got concrete around you in an hour uh, every direction. If I go up on the roof, I can see the, the ocean. Kind of, man. I don't it's know. A hazy middle distance. But I'm sure yeah. you can see the ocean. I can, on a clear not day. just the marine layer. On a, <laughs> on a clear day, <laughs> I can see water. Um, but it's, yeah, I, you you just bragged about this place for so long. I couldn't help myself. I've lived here now, what, three, four times? I love it. I yeah. love California. I hate the taxes, but I love California. I'm not sad about it. I won't talk about taxes. It's not. Um, but, but yes, I am where I usually am and you are somewhere better. Good for you, buddy. Well, what I'd do come you drink to you, but I have to fly through Reno. I know. And Reno I, sucks. Nobody wants, nobody wants to deal with that. <laughs> I've had some good times in Reno, which is funny, but I don't really like Reno. Were they all uh, when you left? I assume. What's that? There's only one good thing to do in Reno, which is leave. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend who lived there. Oh, and, uh, there you go. On purpose? Yeah. He was, he had, he was. He was signed there by his work okay. and ended up meeting, meeting somebody that he really liked. So, nice. he does not live there anymore. He's now moved to Las Vegas. So, I will see him in a month when I am in Las Vegas for the Super Bowl. I'm looking forward to that. But for oh, now... That's right. I may have to crash that party. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. It'll be good. That I've was you there. not saying you're invited, by the way. Thanks a I lot. Ne Bob. I never said you were invited. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you don't need an invitation anyway. You'll just show up. I will. Hey, guys. Yeah, I'll figure you out. Um, what am I drinking? Uh, yes. I am I'm back off the wagon, on the horse. I'm not sure. I've got a Macallan poured here because we're recording this at a time of day that makes it feel more appropriate. The last one we did, 72 hours ago, we did pretty early in the morning. Uh, and I was right hot off the heels of Charleston drinking coffee. Mm -hmm. Black. Now I'm drinking Macallan. So. I was drinking coffee as well. I'm actually drinking what is called a Coquito. Mm -hmm. And this was suggested to me by uh, someone I know on Twitter and Reddit. And probably one of the coolest things that has happened is, is that now people know that I'll drink all sorts of different things. They'll suggest drinks to me, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Uh, obviously, my wife can make just about any drink under the sun. So, she's always like, what do you got for me? 
But this is a, this is an interesting drink. It's basically like from the islands, and I guess it's Puerto Rican based. But it's got rum in it. It's got coconut milk. It's got like some condensed milk and some other stuff. And she's put like cinnamon on top of Did it. Did she make this for you? Yeah. Fanta. She's got a pickled thumb. I love that. It's well, not a I green mean, thumb. She used Although to she manage has that as well. like a thousand plus person bar. Oh, she doesn't yeah. have any drinks. She can really stir it together. Um, I'm an easier audience typically, but she can really do it. It took me a long time to find a girl who was a ballerina and also a bartender. That's right up my alley though. <laughs> this is across the board flexible. Uh, what are we listening to tonight? What we are listening to is uh, a song that we have chosen carefully in honor of tonight's topic, which is how to review and analyze your practice LSAT results. So we'll get into that shortly. But the song that we chose for that is a song by a band that I don't necessarily love, but I actually like this song quite a bit. The band is Paramore, and the song is Decode, which if you watched those oh, epically great, and I'm being sarcastic, Twilight movies, at the end of the first Twilight one, they play this over the credits. And that's where I first heard it. And I was like, well, I didn't like that movie, but man, I love this song. And that's our choice because decoding is really what we're talking about tonight that in terms of be, dealing with uh, practice test the results. Yeah, how do you look at your your feedback and figure out what it means? Um, I'm I'm a little bittersweet on the Twilight movies, or, or torn perhaps, because I think Muse contributed a song or two, one of our favorite bands. Indeed, they did <sighs> multiple yeah. songs. Yeah, it'd be and like I, if Stephanie Meyer went out and wrote some great American novel. I'd be like, oh no. It goes deeper than that. Of course, she never did. No. But <laughs> and won't. <laughs> she and won't. herself, Stephanie Meyer, is a massive Muse fan. She has dedicated, uh, you know, something in the books to them before, where she's like, you know, special thanks to Muse for the inspiration. I remember once seeing something she posted years ago where she was at the Muse concert in Arizona when they were there. So she's a massive Muse fan. But you know, so be it. They're good. <sighs> There's no accounting for good taste. I <laughs> I wonder, Dave, sometimes which of us is going to be the first to bite the bullet and buy the other one a Manson guitar. Mm. And I think it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. Feeling. You haven't seen your Christmas present I yet. I haven't, man. It's not a guitar, though. I'm going to tell you that right now. That's the last thing I need. This place is overflowing. Um, but But one of these days, somebody will. Um, maybe maybe i have maybe. the katara so i don't need that manson right away <laughs> and for those of you who don't know what i'm referring to the bass player uh chris wolstenholm when he plays certain songs he uses kind of like a uh a, a digitally enabled guitar that is custom built it's, it's called like a katara yeah synthesizer slash i'm not even sure how to describe it it's basically got an iPad where the, the, mm -hmm. the string should be, and he plays it on like uh, Madness. And I saw it in concert, and I was like, what is he doing? And I was like, have I been drinking too much? Because I can't <laughs> figure this out. And my, my eyes blurry. I don't see any strings. <laughs> and it turned out that you can actually buy it, and we were able to get it on eBay for know, a pretty reasonable price. A couple hundred or something like that. Something like that. Yeah, it's very cool. Have you? Um, can you play it? I can play it. I don't say I play it very well because it's really complicated and it can do so many different things, but I can make it, I can play Madness on it, for example, and a really? couple other things. So it makes it sound pretty decent. Very cool. I'm going to put that to the test next time I'm up there. You go right ahead. You can show me how to do it. Um, <laughs> until then, what's been going on in the LSAT world? Nothing. LSAT's closed. There's nothing yeah. to talk about. Cool. That was that. There you go. <laughs> it's my favorite LSAT world discussion I've ever had. What an update. <laughs> Nothing to talk about. <laughs> All right. So let's get into what we really want to talk about. We've been yep. fooling around here for a few minutes. Let's talk about how to review these practice tests. And I'm going to start off by reminding everybody that if you want to talk about how to take a practice test, we talked about that a number of weeks ago. We actually intended to do these episodes back to back. And then the November LSAT and the massive explosion that it caused in terms of all the problems blew up. But that is episode 34 of the podcast where we talk about how to take a test, the environment, the timing, the different options that you have. Tonight, we're not going to talk about that. What we're going to talk about instead is, all right, you've taken that test and you've now got your results. What do you do with them? Right. How do you learn from them? How do you learn from the test that you just took? Right. Yeah. What do they tell you? Aside from the base experience. 
Because that to me is, in I think a lot of ways, even more important than the taking itself is where does it send you? What does it do in terms of informing you of what to do next? And that's you know, really what this is. It really is. And it's funny because I use this analogy about digging a mile long trench. And I often talk about when students start preparing for the test, they're being asked to dig a mile long trench and they basically have just their fingers. And that's a tough, tough ask. If someone said, you need to dig this trench with just your hands, you'd be like, oh my God, my life is hell. And then you start learning a little bit about the test. And now it's like you got a fork. But that's still a really tall order. You want to dig a mile long trench with a fork, you're suffering. And that LSAT preparation is about getting better tools and learning so that you don't have a fork, you have a shovel. And then you don't have a shovel, you have a backhoe. And one of the things that that applies to is this idea of taking practice tests. If you just take test after test and you don't learn from it, you're just using a fork to dig that trench. What practice test review does is it improves your understanding of how to dig. It improves the tools that you have, and it helps you to know what parts of the process you should improve. So when we talk about this, I certainly think that learning the concepts is hugely important, but you then seeing how you're putting it into play and what's occurring when you're doing it in a live fire drill is equally important. Yeah, that's precisely it. Where do you find better utensils? Um, all the way up to power tools. As yeah. Were. You need to go from the basics to having the ability to do this well. And the beautiful thing is you can. Mm -hmm. That's not some mystery. We talk about this in our books and courses. We do it at tutoring where we're like, let's go through the process. There are ways to learn this that are established and proven. You can, you can get better. So if you're struggling with this test and you haven't been feeling great about it, relax. There are ways to get better. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can use your own practice test results to improve your performance going forward. Perfect. And that's it, really. Learning, as it were, that's the goal here. How do we essentially develop ourselves into better self-analyzers? It's doable, though. There's an alchemistry to this, I think, at first, but it's more algorithmic than people realize. Well, are you taking the test just to take it, or are you taking the test to learn from it? It better be the latter. It sure should be. Yeah, we've talked a lot about this idea before. Um, so what's step one? After you've taken the test, you're sitting there, you're staring at your outcome, as it were. What do you do? Where well, do you begin? You got to figure out how you're going to review the test. And even before we get into that idea, which I think is really one of the first keys to this discussion, and, and we're going to get into it in detail, I want to kind of like almost provide a disclaimer Okay. It's not a warning. It's more of a disclaimer is that one of the things that I often see with students is that they don't take an appropriate amount of time to review. They are like, I finished the test and then they immediately go look at the questions they missed, whether that was 10 questions or 30 questions. They go look at those and they're like, oh, I see I missed it. Oh, I should have chosen C. And then they're on to the next one because they think that the real value in all this is taking the test. And I am here to say most emphatically, there is value in that. That is not the real value. The real value comes in the review. And it's not just about looking at the ones you missed. I know that you and I are both big believers in looking at the ones that you got right as well sure. and making sure that you solved it the right way, that you were, you know, you really did understand what you're doing and you were as efficient as possible and that you didn't miss something, that maybe you could have done it better. It's a strange thing to, to wrap your head around, but getting something right for the right reason is hugely important when it comes to this. And I think a lot of people overlook that. Oh, I got it right. But how did you get it right? And can you duplicate that success under similar but slightly different circumstances? A lot of people, again, fail to recognize that opportunity or potentially that danger. It's funny. I actually had a question come in on the forum this weekend, and I spent a lot of time explaining uh, questions from the November LSAT in the last couple of days. And she had asked a question. She's like, look, I got this problem right really quickly. I just want to make sure I did it the right way. Is this the reasoning? And I was like, perfect. Dude, That's exactly what yeah, you're doing. Good for her. What a great question to ask. I yeah, love when you, students ask me that. Well, she also put her entire process. This is what I thought about this answer. This is why I dismissed it. Am I correct about it? And my answer was basically, yes, you got it right. Well done. 
beautiful for me because I'm like, confirm something that for her, she was, she felt like she probably had done it right, but she wasn't sure. That's, that's perfect. That's the way to study where you come to the table thinking, this is what I did. This is what I should have done. Was I right or could I have done it better? Yeah. So to put a hard nail in this disclaimer, I think what you're saying is a review doesn't just consist of analysis of your failures. It consists of analysis of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Could your successes have been even more successful and done go. more quickly? Could you have avoided failure? And does it reveal something to you that, hey, there's a big hole here. I need to actually get into this and focus on it a little bit more. Yeah. I know neither you nor I teach a ton of classes anymore. Um, me slightly more often than you do, but <laughs> both of us a bit absent. Um, but when we do, and certainly for myself, one of the points that I try to emphasize early is, look, even if an idea feels fundamental, dare I say beneath you, if you can get a question right in 40 seconds, that's not to say you couldn't have gotten it right in 35 or 30. There's almost always still an opportunity to be better or more precise or to move from that 98% to 99% kind of guarantee. That I think is what a lot of people overlook in their reviews. And it's why I think you have set this talking point up so soon. It really is the case. I mean, if you could improve your timing on a question by two seconds, and you did that for every question in the section, you just added another minute mm -hmm. to consider the problem at the end. And so when we look at this, that has got to be the kind of like the overarching theme of what we were talking about. It's not just about, oh, I missed that. Let's go on. It's about carefully delving into each problem and making sure that you really understood what was happening and that you can take away the things that the people who make this test were doing and know that your responses and your analysis was as good as it possibly could be. So everything that we talk about in terms of like reviewing tests is going to start from that particular point. Don't speed through it. You know, I've had students who are like, okay, I took a test this morning and I'm going to take another test this afternoon. I'm like, uh, what are you doing? Slow your old son. <laughs> yeah, you can't learn <clears throat> anything from that. That's ridiculous. You can look at a few things and then you're just taking tests because you think taking tests is the value. And it's easy to take a test. It's mentally draining, but you just put 35 minutes on the clock right. or the clock's counting down from 35 minutes. You sit down, you take it, and you're like, okay, I've done the work. No, no, no. It's much harder to review a test, in my opinion. And that's where the real make or break information comes back to students. I think I know that the answer to this is um, unanswerable, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there any kind of ratio of time that you would say? So if a test takes, let's say, 35 a section, is there a uh, a standard type of proportion or if you're going to spend that much time doing it, you have to spend that much time reviewing it or twice as long reviewing it. Or It's at least one-to-one -one in my okay. opinion. Okay. That's what I figured you would say. I didn't know if you had any more precise calculation. I don't. And part of it too depends on how you do. Look, if you're really good at logic games, you probably don't need to spend 45 minutes reviewing a full section of logic games. If you really struggle at logic games, it might take you two hours. That's exactly right. To review it well. So I, I, I think a lot of people get hung up in this idea that there's a perfect prescription, a magic bullet. And that's just the review in, a, right. in a, something like a logic game. You may have a situation where you come back to perfect the game and you do it multiple times. Uh, you know, as instructors, we've all done these games a bunch of times and we've learned a lot from doing that. That's something that should be built into the process that you're taking. So, Yeah, yeah full confession. Um, and based on the heels of something you and I just did, you mentioned to me the notion of doing templates for game, I believe it was game two of the last test, the November test that just came out a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't done templates for it. The first thing I did after we recorded that last podcast I sat down and I redid that game with templates because I still felt like I had something to learn from it. You couldn't hurt yourself. Well, I'm, well, you'd be surprised what I can do. But, <laughs> <laughs> but in that particular instance, uh, no, I was really glad I did it because it, it revealed a lot to me. It wasn't the first way that I'd done it. I didn't struggle the first way that I'd done it, but I'm glad I did it differently. I'm glad I went back with fresh and different eyes and did it again. And I think that's a lot of what this conversation is necessarily built upon. Just because you think you know it doesn't mean you know it as well as you could. 
Agreed, 100%. So let's get into it then. Let's, let's talk about the different ways to review the tests themselves. And I think, you know, we have kind of in our minds a, a, an approach to doing this. I'm going to kind of turn it upside down and kind of go through a couple different review formats that you can use. Okay. I'm going to start with what I consider to be the most standard way of reviewing it, which is to do it immediately, mm -hmm. which probably I think to most people is what they default to. I certainly do. This is the, the typical way that I will go through tests, but we'll talk about some other methods as well. Sure. And I will say this, there is no right one right way. And when I work with students individually, I will tell them to use different methods with different tests simply because if you do the same thing over and over again, it gets boring. So what you really want to try to do is mix it up. So the, the first method is really that immediate review, which is a great way to kind of like get instant feedback. And especially if you're low on study time, it compresses things. And that is just the process of once you've completed the test, go check the answers. Right. Write down everything that you missed or anything that you thought was difficult. And then go back and review all of those questions. Then scan the ones that you did answer correctly and felt decent about just to make sure that you understood everything. That is the easiest and most direct way. The one important part of this that you really have to focus on is the idea of tracking your misses. All right, and we've talked a little bit about this at other times. When you miss a question, this is a gold mine that you can now dig through for a long time because you have just shown yourself to not have understood something. And it could have been a specific phrase, it could have been a concept, it could have been some kind of weird question stem. So every time you have that kind of situation, make note of it. We talk about like having wrong answer trackers and things like that. And I consider it to be a little bit more than just wrong answer trackers. It's almost like interesting question trackers. Right, right, right. Things that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Make sure that you track everything that you are looking at. It becomes that a journal, probably, like a diary. Basically. It's exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, there's an, another part of this too that I, I want to maybe emphasize. <laughs> And it's psychological. A lot of this is psychological. It's easy to get either fearful as you begin to track your results or very like self-debasing. People see the results like, I'm stupid. I can't believe I made that mistake. I can't believe I missed this thing again. I know better, blah, blah, blah. But to me, as you just said, every time you make a mistake, it's an opportunity. It doesn't count yet. Nobody sees it. No law schools are judging you. Dave and I aren't. Uh -huh. So. <laughs> I mean, not out loud, but this is just a chance for you to realize you could be better at something and missing that question shows you the path to improvement. That's how I see it. I love mistakes in practice because it means there's a much greater chance they won't happen in reality. That's, that's exactly see, right. That's how I see this. Celebrate your misses. Celebrate your mistakes. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to celebrate them. Well, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but... At the same time, like if you can see the mistake and figure out why, what an incredible insight. Celebrate that part. Right. Where you overcome it and then all of a sudden you're like, all right, I've learned something here. Yeah. How do you climb a mountain that you can't see the route to the top of? This is the route. This is the map. That's what I love about this type of like post uh, analysis. I think it's an incredible opportunity. All right. And so with that in mind, when you go through a process like immediately reviewing the test, what you then do is for those questions that you did miss and you don't understand all that clearly, come back to them a few days later. Look at them again, go through them and add them to that list of problems that you're going to review to make sure that there's not some type of trend. Because one of the things that you're really looking for is a long-term trend. Sure. Are you missing causal questions constantly? Well, maybe you need to go back and not do more causal questions, but go back and read a little bit about the theory of causality and the different things that the test makers do. Make sure that you really did understand it, then go back and do more causal problems. Yeah, this is where you can start to find a pattern. Um, there's a, a couple of different names that have been assigned to this process, but I don't know if you want to talk about this quite yet. In terms of probably okay, <laughs> I think we'll move off of. I don't want to. I don't want to jump review. your gun. 
No, the immediate review is just like the most basic thing in the world. Right. Hey, I just took the test. Let me go look at the right answers. Let me compare what I got right to what I got wrong. I'll review it later. It's fast. It's quick. It's instantaneously gratifying. It takes a certain weird psychopathy not to want to know immediately what you've done. Oh, yeah. I find it very difficult to wait. (laughs) Yeah, that kind of delayed gratification. You know me. Certainly yeah, well, not. this is what you get with another of the methods that people use to review practice tests, and that's blind review. Right. And I think blind review is one of those things that for the right person can really be very helpful. I think it's also very time consuming, and you want to be careful about doing it constantly over and over again because all of a sudden you find that it's hard to get through tests. It's tedious. I had a tutoring student a couple of years back who would tell me, like, I'm not able to take enough practice tests because of how long it takes me to review each one. And I would ask, how long? She'd be like, eight or nine hours it would take me to get through the results of a test. And I'd be like, we need, That's to, talk, a long time. We need to talk about that. <laughs> because what are you doing? You don't need to do that every single time. And it was, you- yeah, her, her issue um, in particular was that she had so little self-confidence in Even when she had done things right or how she was analyzing things correctly, she spent 30 minutes on a question. Mm. And it became so tedious as to just essentially be like uh, an anchor. She just couldn't move forward with things. And I was like, look, you understand this. Kind of like the forum question you just said you got asked. Mm -hmm. That was the thing she couldn't get out of her own way from on every single question. If you're reviewing it that deeply over and over again, you're going to burn out fast. Yeah. And she was. I mean, I could, even just in conversations with her, I was like, oh man, I'm worried about you. Well, who would want to look at more questions if they felt that every single time was going to be another half hour per question? Yeah. I mean, you'd know it well at the end, but boy, you'd hate yourself. (laughs) That was the problem is even after a half hour, I'd be like, explain this to me. She said, well, I think I understand. And I'd be like, oh man, you got to stop second, third, 50th guessing yourself. Yeah, you need the fast and dirty understanding. At some point. Yeah. Um, So there is a balance to this, I think we can say. So let's talk a little bit about blind review, which is a different way to go through this. And of course, after we go through some of these basic review methods, we'll then talk about like, well, what do we do in terms of like getting information that allows us to analyze bigger patterns, which I think to me personally is is a little bit, it's probably the most interesting section of this discussion. I agree with you. And so what is blind review? Blind review gives you the opportunity to look at things in like slow motion and then make a decision as to whether or not you feel like you made the right choice. So the approach here is a little bit different. And you can put you can spin variations on this too, sure. as we'll talk about. As I'm sure we will. Yeah. After you complete the test, here's where you kind of like go psychopathic. You don't <laughs> check your answers. You're like, hey, I finished it. And in, and unlike me, who's like instant gratification, like what's my score? Uh, you don't. Instead, you go back and you, the way I always recommend this is as you go through the test, you mark problems that you think are challenging or that you missed or just generally difficult. Anything that's notable to you that you feel like I could use another look at that or I thought was, you know, I might not have gotten it correct. You go ahead and you write those down. Yeah. If you couldn't finish questions, you add that to the list as well. Now, I'm going to jump in real quick. Power score plug. Our interface allows you to do this as part of the system that we have built. So yeah. if you're taking tests in the Power Score system, again, pure plug, you can flag questions as uncertain. You, when you actually flag a question with a little flag, it will save it and you can see it after the fact as part of the scoring algorithm output. And you can look and be like, oh, question 12, that was one that I actually marked as I was doing it. Mm-hmm. So, And if you guess on problems, you can make that note as well. And then yeah, you can turn it on and out. off. Yeah, you can see the ones you guessed on as part or as not part of your score. Anyway, it's a very cool system. Very proud of what we've built. I think so. <laughs> and I agree. I'll pull up a uh, some of our analytics a little bit later in this podcast and yeah. just kind of run through some of the information that we get from it. And then we'll talk a little bit about how we use that information to make certain analyses about what we're seeing. So, all right. You've now made your super long list of questions or super short list of <laughs> questions, short. depending upon where you're scoring and how you felt about this. Now you go back and you review the questions and you do them untimed. 
So let's say question 12 was one where you were like, I didn't like that, or that really bothered me. I think I might have missed it. Now you get the opportunity to go back to number 12, and you have the opportunity to try to understand it as well as possible. There's no clock on you. Um, there's no time limit. Mm -hmm. Now, a different version of this, by the way, says go back and do it and give yourself only the normal amount of time for each question. Right. Try it again, but without the context, essentially. Yeah. Of, of without, the full section of the full, with, yeah. Yeah, without the context of the full section and without kind of like this unlimited time to redo it. I'm, it's all about what makes you happy as, as a test taker and how each person learns. Person A might love that, person B might hate it. So you have to use your own judgment as to whether or not you would put tweaks into this process like that. Be assured that you're not going to hurt yourself by adding something like that or taking it away. But the idea is usually give yourself as much time as possible to see whether or not you really can understand that. And then go back after you've finished that out and take a look at all the initial answer choices you had and compare them to your new answer choices. Because this is where you really start to see, did I keep the same answer? You know, did I change my answer? And you've kind of like gone through all of this process. Now you go score your test. Yeah. Did I improve, stagnate, or... As it were, get worse. Well, you get two scores. Exactly. Your first score is what they would call the original score, where it's like, this is how I would have done if I took it that very first time. So maybe you got uh, a 158. Now, in blind review, maybe you looked at 20 questions and you changed a bunch of answers, and now your blind review score is 165. And again, the numbers, I'm just yeah, picking them out of thin air. Purely up So... You have created really what is like, I could have gotten to 165. And certainly from a confidence standpoint, that's fantastic because you're like, all right, I do have the ability to answer this. I could have gotten that type of score on this test. I just need to get a little bit faster, a little bit more comfortable. So I think in many respects, it is often a process that makes people feel really good. But keep in mind that you now have these two scores and there are differences. That second review of those questions is going to show you a couple different things because you have all these different answers out there, some of which you might have, you know, made mistakes on, not made mistakes on. And so the answers fall into a couple different categories. Right. First off, all the questions that you didn't initially mark, you better have gotten all those right. <laughs> all right. Now, if you did, congratulations. The ones that you didn't mark but you got wrong – you need to go look at that because the question tricked you. Some false confidence, yeah. Yeah, that's a question that goes on to the master list of I need to look at this later on because I didn't even see it coming. That's like getting hit in the back of the head with a hammer uh, where somebody sneaks up on you and they're right. like, bang, you had no idea that you were going to miss that. And those are some of the most dangerous questions because when people come out of the test, they oftentimes don't know that they've missed certain questions and then all of a sudden they get their score back and it's different than what they expected. That's right. Yeah, that's not a fist fight. That's like a sucker punch and it's a very different experience. And the next group of questions that you run into are the ones that you knew were problematic and then when you did it upon review, you kept your answer. Mm -hmm. Now, that'll be a very decisive because if you kept your answer the second time and it was correct, all right, good. All right, you understood it. And the second time when you reviewed it, you still got it right. It's a huge How, confidence boost. It means your instincts were correct. The first right. time under time pressure, under that type of like stress and speed, you were, you were on the money. And when I work with students, I like to see a high percentage of connection on this. Me too. That I chose the same answer twice and my percentage of getting that correct was really good because that tells me that they have good basic instincts and we don't have to go back to the fundamentals. They're well trained on that yeah. particular case. Yeah. Now... A lot of times people get really depressed if they kept the same answer and it turned out it was wrong. And in fact, my view of this is completely opposite of the typical student. The typical student is like, oh man, I can't believe I did that. I I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like- Yeah, I blew it twice, but, but I feel the same way you do and I'll let you elaborate. And my elaboration comes down to this. Oh my gosh, you have just been handed the best opportunity to learn in your LSAT experience because two times this question tricked you. If you don't think you can learn something from this, then you're never going to learn anything from a question. Yeah. Those questions are like the gold star questions that 
<clears throat> as you write them down and make note of them, you really want to make sure that you come back to those multiple times later on and look at them again and say, what was it about this to really understand? Don't ever ignore those problems. Deep dive on those and make sure that you're 100% clear on what it says. Yeah. They show you a conceptual deficiency, typically. And that's a clear chance where you can immediately be better. Yeah, you've, you've got a, a hole here. It's great. Yeah, exactly. There's a big hole that you need to actually get working on and to focus on. And that's also the case with the last group of answers that we run into, where you marked it as a problem, chose one answer, and then when you reviewed it, you chose a different answer. Mm -hmm. This is often related to conceptual problems as well, or you didn't understand something in the problem in one of the two times that I you actually went I think it depends on, on the nature of you changing it. So if, if you've talked yourself off of an initial right answer, that's a very different outcome or scenario than if you've talked yourself into an eventual right answer based off of your first mistake or your first miss. If you change it to a right answer, that's showing improvement. Which We're shows off. that conceptually you've probably got a handle on it, or at least it's more likely, and you made a mistake – I'm, call it sloppy, call it speed, call it pressure, whatever. Um, if you've talked yourself off of a right, an initial right answer into something wrong, that's something different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you went the wrong way upon yeah. review. I had this right and, and now I've backed away from it. But you know what? Again, that becomes one of these hard or tricky problems. So, or if you missed it with both of your answers. Missed it, yeah. If you changed it and you chose a second wrong answer, now you've got a real situation of positivity because you can really learn from this problem. There were two answer choices that tricked you on this. Uh, the speeded really three and the, yeah, because the speeded and the unpressure. <laughs> it's really three that tricked you because you, you missed the right <laughs> answer and then you chose two incorrect answers. So that's the kind of thing where I'm like, I want to really get in there and dig around and try to figure it out. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, the, the finding a diamond there in yeah. the middle of your review. Yeah, all of this is gold. So what I hope anyone listening to this is gathering from it is by doing this type of review, in almost every instance, in almost every case, there is some sort of reveal. There's something about the nature of what you've done that you can learn from, either to continue, which is good, or to improve upon, which is often. Yeah, I think um, in our last podcast, we were talking about the November 2019 Logic Games. I referenced a blog that I written called The Benefits of Failure. Yeah, you did. Where it was, uh, you know, most people think I failed, I didn't do well. Oh my gosh, that's the worst. I'm like, no, no, no. Learn from your failure. Your failure yeah. tells you so much about what you need to change to become successful. That's a really positive thing. Failure to me isn't a bad thing. It's a learning experience. And this is about a perspective or a framework that you have to approach your life with, let alone the LSAT. Yeah. I mean, so, there's a dozen different versions of this Edison quote about, I haven't mm. failed to develop a light bulb. I've only found out 10,000 filaments that won't work or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, I haven't failed. I just found a bunch of ways that yeah. uh, weren't the, the right solution. Every one of those has moved me a little bit closer to the one that will work. I love that. Failure by elimination. That's really what this is. It's a defender assumption is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> You're eliminating problems and making only, the central core stronger Only you can squeeze it through your own trademark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, fantastic. I, I will say that the, the supporter well, you're defender right. you're assumption right. model is one of the things I am most proud of, of having <sighs> kind of invented, I guess. We give each other a hard time, but I can't, I can't on that. That's, it's really a work of art. It's, it provides clarity to what is a really <laughs> tough concept. And I remember I struggled for so long to explain that to students until one day I was like, I think I got it. So I will bring it in as needed. And it has been stolen relentlessly. <laughs> Everybody loves it. I won't point fingers, but it's... Yeah, yeah. you don't need to. Uh, that's true of a lot of stuff that we do, but I so suppose. what? We'll, uh, as long as they're not too uh, overt about okay, it. Okay, fair enough. But that to me, the, all of this is the process really of, of what we mean when we describe blind review. That's what it is. Is the idea of you have to compare what's happening when you don't have the full-fledged pressure of speed and context and uncertainty to what happens when you do. This is the nature of how it has to go and you need to track this stuff as you move through it. Yeah, you're delaying gratification on the score, but you're giving yeah. yourself a second bite at the apple with the questions you found to be difficult. And then it. even your analysis of that is going to make a difference. 
And before we go on to the, you know, the other method that we sometimes have students use, mm -hmm. I will make one additional comment that I always tell people to do is they kind of like end not just their practice test, but any blind review that they do. And that is predict your score. Oh, yeah. This is the, the one part that I see people never doing. And it drives me crazy because it would be a skill that if you could develop it, and I can guarantee that you can, that come test day would be hugely useful to you. Yeah. So the idea here, just as kind of like a sidebar, is once you finish the practice test and you've gone through the whole thing, you get into the last question and time runs out, no matter what method you're going to use to review it, stop before you look at any answers or any questions and predict what score you think you're going to get and why. I thought games was really hard and that set me back. I'm hoping the scale is favorable, but I think this is probably a 156. I think you mean in a way too, like raw score. Uh, because raw score otherwise and scaled. It, yeah, it becomes tricky to, I guess you'd have to have the scaled and to couple it. But Yeah, and you're going to get that. But what I'm attempting to get people to kind of like train themselves to do is to guess what the scale is going to be and guess what their score is going to be. Mm, so that come test day, they have a better sense of, well, what was that like? And I think that was a tight scale. And I think that, that score for me is a 164. Because people come out and they're immediately like, I don't know how I did. I'm like, you've just had months of opportunities to play this game. <laughs> I play it every time I do just about anything where there's kind of like a black and white result. I always want to know beforehand what's the answer and try to predict it. So as you do this, that is the first thing that you should always do. Now, if you do blind review, you can do it again. Mm -hmm. After you've now predicted it, re-predict your score and see whether or not your prediction of the scale has changed at all. And you may find after having done this for 10 or 15 tests that you just don't have a clue. All right, that's fine. At least you've learned something there. On the other hand, you may find that I'm actually pretty good at this. I'm pretty good at predicting my own performance and I get a good sense of difficulty as I'm going through this. That gives you something to fall back on in test day when you know everybody and their brother is sending me messages saying, well, what do you think about the scale? What do you think about the difficulty of it? This is how I felt about it. And yeah. I always go back to it. It was like, well, did you predict scores while you're preparing? And almost always the answer is no. What's that? What does that well, mean? this is what we're talking about right now. Yeah. Always predict your score. Even Always learning your you're scale. bad at it is a teachable moment. Yeah, everything's um, teachable, man. Exactly. But that's really what this is. It's this like granular self-analysis that we're trying to get people to invest, invest in, really. I, I do this, <laughs> use the word game a minute ago. I don't like that word because I feel like that's kind of what this is. You're playing a game, but it teaches you. As you go, I have my students a lot of times, as they'll do even just a section or a problem set, I'd be like, go through and rank every one of these questions, one to five. Five being like, I know I got this right. I will bet you any amount of money the mortgage rides on this question. One is like, dude, I got hit by a truck. I have no, I, I threw a dart. I don't know. I got nothing. And anything in between, obviously. Three being like, I think, but eh, it was between two. Go rank all these questions and see what happens. You miss a lot of fours and fives. That's a very different problem than getting a lot of ones and twos right, as I see it. Very much so. It means you were badly calibrated, really, in both cases. Yes, but the more severe problem I mean, is to miss all the ones that you thought you had totally sure. right. Sure. Better to get more right than you thought than the other <laughs> way. Of course. Of course. Yeah. But – if you're if you're getting questions right where you second guess and doubt, that tells you something different than missing questions where you were just absolutely certain you had it right. And you have to know where on this fence you live. And look, if you run through a section and everything's a three, that's different too. Why do you have so much innate self-doubt about things that you are getting right? Why do you have so much confidence in things where you missed it? And whether you do this with questions or the overall test score that you get, sure. notice what we're asking you to do. Self-analyze Self and then compare your results to how you actually performed. Or at least compare your perception to how you actually performed. It's a reality check. And that's a scary thing to do. Maybe we should use that. We just call it do a reality check and have you rate all the questions and rate your score out. And that as long as you memorable. never ask me to participate, I'm fine with it.
<laughs> I think I may use that. This is our new patented method. It's called a reality, reality check, and it check. focuses just on question difficulty and certainty as well as score outcome and scale outcome. Perfect. I want 10%. You can have 10%. Yeah, really. <laughs> What's Nobody the reality of that? that? 10% Did you do nothing, a reality nothing. check is going to be my new, my new <laughs> mantra. <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> Let's go to the last method of uh, reviewing these tests, which sure. is really kind of like a hybrid of the two that I already mentioned. And we call it delayed blind review. And it gives you immediate gratification because after you've completed the test, you get to check your answers. Mm -hmm. But all those questions that you noted as being problematic, you don't write down you don't make note of what the correct answer was per se. You just check your score. So you're like, okay, I now know that I got a 161 or whatever your score was. Well, so then you take yeah, a break. Right. I actually prefer at least a day, but I've seen people do this with a few hours and it works. But I think their, their recall is too good for the most part. Mm -hmm. You take a day off, maybe two or three days, and you come back and you review all the questions. The ones you got right, the ones that you got wrong, and especially those questions where you marked that there was a problem and you see whether or not you get the same answer. If you change your answers again, you recalculate your score because you probably will almost for sure change an answer or two. You recalculate your score, which creates a delayed blind review score, which again should be higher than your original score. And what it does is it at least gives you the opportunity to say, all right, that's what my score was. And then you don't come back until later to review it. So you're not doing it immediately thereafter. And you can mix and mass match pieces of this, as you can see. Was, as we've already talked about, when you're reviewing questions, you could take 10 minutes or you could put yourself on a timer and be like, all right, I'm going to redo this game. Eight minutes and 45 seconds. Here we go. You have the ability to play with the parameters of any of these types of review, come up with different types of review. I know of other types of reviews that are out there. Um, and they all have some benefit as long as they make you sit down and look at your mistakes until you feel like you understand the problem. Or you, under, you feel like, I can't get anything more out of this. You know, there's a whole series of questions that are in LR that are like philosophically based that I find to be not super helpful for students to study, but they tend to want to study them because they're so brutally difficult. Be like... You know, the happiness that is inherent within the value of money <laughs> is non-mutable. And I'm like, I, you're not going to learn anything from this because the guy who writes this or the person who writes it just really wants to show you how academically elite they are. <laughs> just sort of how failed at Hallmark they are. <laughs> you know exactly, the, <laughs> you know exactly the, what you're talking about. The stream about. of questions, yeah, the vein yeah, yeah. of questions. They're this all guy really... couldn't make it at bumper stickers, so now he's doing this. <laughs> I, I really dislike those questions because every time I start reading them, I think to myself, oh, really? I'm going to have to fight through this type yeah, of stimulus? I was this close to banging my head on the desk just then. So Yeah. We all know how lazy I am from <laughs> me having described it many times. And if I'm going to have to work through a stimulus, I'm not happy. Oh. I want to learn weird facts yeah. like about the stickleback fish or something right. crazy. An action is a moral deed if the outcome can be... I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> no, stop talking. Like, all right. <laughs> so, yeah. Bye. But, I mean, I, your point, I think, is well-received, despite that, um, which is that in every case, there's something to be learned here. And that's what I, I really – I guess if there was one central message to this entire episode, Dave, that I wish people would latch on to, it's that failure breeds success. That the things that you do wrong teaches you or teach you how not to be wrong as often. Please – embrace the struggles when it comes to this. Uh, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. That's exactly right. The benefits of failure can be vast if you know where to look. Yeah. Here's what's interesting, and I, I know the transition you're about to make. I can feel it in the air. What oh, we've yeah. talked about so far is really just how to deal with post-test results off an answer key. We haven't talked any deeper about the feedback that you can potentially get. When you do something like blind review or immediate review or any of the, the methods that you can use, usually it is largely based upon, I'm going to look at this problem in a very black and white, what's the right answer and what are the wrong answers? Mm -hmm. And I know that you and I both agree that that's helpful. Sure. However, we also happen to be huge fans of analytics. And so... 
that's what I want to turn to next because I feel like the review that you do as a student is going to help you understand, all right, where am I in terms of understanding what is actually on the page in this problem? However, it's really hard to take a step back, get away from the trees, and see the forest of all your results, especially over multiple tests. Because analytics is the kind of thing that allows you to do that. So you really want to be able to input your test results into a system that allows you to see how things have been going over time. You might discover, wait a second, I keep missing this type of question. I had no idea. I'm no good at it. All right, I'm going to go study it. Right. And so one of the things that um, we offer in our courses, in our self-study area, is you can put in your test results. Like if you buy a digital test from us, once you take the test, it automatically scores it for you. And what it does is it compiles into our system, and our system feeds back a bunch of analytics. And I want to talk about those as kind of like an interim here before we talk about how we can interpret those analytics, just to really give people a sense of the kind of things that they should know about their particular performance. Right. So... If you take a digital test, the analytics are actually included in the interface. If you do this on a paper version, in our self-study site, you can actually input your results. So if you're an international test taker and you're still using paper until they change it over eventually, you can go ahead and just put in your results and then it'll tabulate everything for you. And so what I want to do is I want to describe what is covered and uh, just kind of like walk through this and take a look at it. John, are you cool with me doing that? Yeah, of course, man. I mean, this is this is what most people see when they inevitably take practice tests. Most people don't just sit there and do them in isolation. They do them through our interface. They do them and then input their answers into our system to see their score. So this is, yeah, this is crucial. And for me as an instructor, one of the things that I always say to students is, I need to see your results. Oh, yeah. And they're like, well, here's my answer sheet. I'm like, I don't need to see this. <laughs> All right. I can sit down and look at it. But that's not efficient. I want to see it run through an analytics program, preferably one that we've built because I know exactly what I'm looking for inside of that, as we will discuss in just a few minutes. So sometimes people don't, I think, appreciate or necessarily understand the various pieces that we're looking for. So if you run through one of our systems and you put your results in, you really come back to about four or five pages worth of different results. And it's not a single page. It goes on and on down the screen. And I realize that it's a lot of information, but trust me, from a teaching standpoint, this is absolute gold for yeah. us to understand student performance and to direct people to continue preparing and to make changes uh, that they might not otherwise see. So the, the main page that we have is the overall breakdown, which has things like your raw score, your test score, your percentiles. And then that's done in a visual layout. And then we kind of roll through each section, which immediately allows me to see, you know, how you performed overall. Was games your problem? Was it reading comp? Were you just in the middle on logical reasoning? Those are the types of things that anybody can kind of like get a sense of just from scoring their own test. It's the next sections that really are useful to us. Because what we're able to do is we go through problem by problem and we take a look at all the information about the question, the question type that's there, the percentage of answer choices and, and, and people who chose each answer, both correct and incorrect, the overall difficulty of the problem, whether or not you tag the question as being a guess or uncertain. You know, so I can look at a question here and it might be like, all right, 72% of the people chose the correct answer, but 23% chose this wrong answer choice. Well, I'm going to go look at that wrong answer choice and figure out why almost a quarter of people chose that. What's so attractive about it? Or maybe I'll look at another problem and I see that only 31% of people answered the question correctly. And I know it's a high difficulty problem. All right, what made it so high difficulty? Mm -hmm. These are the things where you can use the statistics to inform you about the problems that you've just done. And we haven't even gotten to the part where the statistics tell us about your performance. Right. So it reflects back. That information is available for all the sections thereafter. So every single question on the test is classified, the right, the wrong answers are all broken down. To me, that's hugely valuable because on a, as you said earlier, John, a granular level, <laughs> one by one, I can look at each of the questions and kind of see how things happen. And the next couple of pages break it down 
sectionally. For example, the next page is Logic Games, and I can now see inside your, your overall performance. How'd you do on global questions? How'd you do on local questions? Did you get all the list questions right? You better have. <laughs> Did you miss a bunch of accept questions? You know, what about the questions like rule substitution and justify? Right. Uh, how did all those go? I can look at each game and see whether or not all of a sudden you ran out of time in the fourth game. I can look at your performance and see like you're struggling in grouping or whether it's linearity that's giving you difficulty. Did you miss a bunch of easy questions? Did you miss a bunch of hard questions? We can go through all this again on a question by question level and break it down. When we do that for LR, it's kind of the same thing, except now we just take all questions and pile them in together so we can see how you did on must be true questions. Oh, there was 11 must be true questions on this test and you got four of them right. That's not a good sign to me, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Or you got nine of them right. That's a much better sign to me. So I can kind of look at every single question type. I can look at reasoning types. I can look at things like, how'd you do in the first 10? Let's hope you did well because those questions are generally easier. How'd you do in the last 10? Those are a lot harder on average as questions. Most people perform worse in the last 10 than they do in the first 10. But if you didn't, that tells me something. I can see question families. Did you miss a bunch of first family questions? Did you miss a bunch of second family questions? How did that go? Because each one of those pieces of information is also useful to me. I can see the areas that you were strongest in, the areas that you were weakest in, and so on and so on. And reading comprehension is exactly the same. It breaks it down by type, shows it to me visually, gives me the percentiles. When we work with students, when you're working with yourself, this is the kind of data that you have to have sliced and diced so that you can see not just individual questions, but how the questions connect to each other, the types, the categories, things that you might not even realize connect questions together, like the reasoning types that are out there or the type of game that it's actually coming from. That's beautiful. Can, can I give you a compliment real quick? I keep you, wanting to jump in and add more to this and you're killing it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got nothing. Every time I'm like, oh, he forgot. Him. Oh no, he mentioned it. No, I'll mention it. Yeah. <laughs> Continue, man. No, that's actually really the end of that. I, I, I guess the last point I was going to so make good. is we can show it with guesses or without guesses, go back and look at the whole thing. So I can kind of like, I can figure, you know, that tells us how lucky you were really. Oh, you added eight questions correct from, from guessing. That's not going to happen most of the time. So, you know, we can kind of, we can break it down that way. But you need to have analytics that allow you to see section difficulty, question difficulty, all those different types of things there. Yeah. So that difficulty really... thing, I, I, I just, I have to reemphasize. It's so important. You're going to get questions right that most people miss. You're probably going to miss a question now and then that most people get right. You've got to be able to make that distinction. Even if you got it right and most people didn't, you need to go look at what it was that most people missed. It's going to come up again. It caused an issue for too many people for you not to be hyper aware of the issue itself. I think that's a great example. You know, again, let's say we've got a question out there that's 30% of the people got it right and you got it yeah, right. There you go. All right. First off, excellent. All right. We're, that's well good done. Job. Yeah. And I, I'll be the first person to get in line and be like, that's really good. That's a very hard LSAT question. LSAT questions very rarely go under 20% correct. Statistically, if you just I mean, guess, you have a one in five chance of getting the right answer on any given problem, assuming it's independent which somewhat is, not always though. So 20% should be the baseline. If you have an answer that's under 20%, you know what that's telling you? The answer is so good, it's repelling people. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really well-made problem. Um, let's say you have a question that's like 30% difficult and you get it right. You don't just pat yourself on the back and be like, got it right, I'm, I'm a genius. Instead, be like, well, why was this so hard and where did everybody else go? Like I can look at answers and I'm like, look at all the answers are all about the same percentage. Mm -hmm. Clearly, people didn't understand this problem. Maybe there's something in the stimulus that they weren't clear about at all. Yeah. Or alternatively, I'll go look at it and I'll be like, wow, 58% chose this wrong answer. All right, this problem was difficult, perhaps, but there's a wrong answer that's incredibly attractive that really amped up the difficulty. Let's go look at that answer and at least understand how they tried and successfully did trap a huge percentage of people. Yeah. Speaking as someone who teaches this, and I, I can speak for Dave, questions like that are the ones 
that's what's on the menu that I'm most interested in trying. Like, that's what I want to understand. That's what I want to know how I can teach to people because I know that's what caused all the issues. If 92% of people got it right, who cares? I mean, to put it somewhat bluntly. Yeah. But if 38% of people got it right, mm. <laughs> Well, think about and the now, difference. In, in, now we've in, got something exotic. Look at this, for example. Let's say you have a question that 60% of the people get right. All right. The four wrong answer choices each have 10% selection rate. Eh, yeah. If that's how that, it's split, yeah. It just means that people, If it's 60-40, it's different. Exactly. That's my, my count, oh, my next example. Go. Then we look at a problem where, again, 60% of the people got it right, but another answer has 35%, and then the remaining answers are each 1%. I'm going to get a lot more value out of looking at that second problem because there's something in there that is like the classic sirens of yore that is out there on the rocks singing the song and they're trying sirens, to bring your yeah. ship over to crash on those rocks. It's so Homeric. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I think, you know, this really circles back to a point that you and I have touched on many times in, in the episodes, which is the people who are best at this test approach it as though they have to teach it. Approach yeah. it as though it is something to be explained to someone else. And it, that's it, precisely the type of mindset that you're describing right now. Yeah, you actually bring up an excellent point. And it's something that I have been known to say to students who have said to me, all right, I've reviewed that test. And I'm like, do you feel like you know it? And they'll be like, yeah, I'm really good. I'll be like, great. I want you to explain question 22 to me right now. Which, of course, in bird culture, that's a, <laughs> <laughs> that's a jerk move. <laughs> Chris, I do it with a smile on my face. Like, hey, I know this sucks, but I'm going to do it anyway. Like, what in the world is bird culture? But, <laughs> it's a Rick and Morty reference, yeah, exactly. as you well know. I do. This episode of Rick and Morty with the snakes is great. Oh, anyway, fantastic. that aside, and they'll go to that question, and then sometimes they'll be like, all right, I got to read it. I'm like, I'll allow it. And they'll read it, and then they'll be like, okay, I think I remember this. I was like, you don't know it well enough. If you're still struggling to remember it after having read it, what has to be at least a second or third time, because I'm not going to choose an easy question for someone to explain to me, sure. it means you didn't know it well enough. And that's where the teaching test comes in, where we say, if you really want to prove if you know something, teach it to somebody else. If you really want to know how well you know it, teach it to somebody who actually teaches this for a living, because they'll know immediately whether or not you were on the right path or <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, you and I are harder to have as a captive audience. So you may just have to settle <laughs> for a roommate or a slightly aggrieved loved one. I um, think we'd be quicker to <laughs> criticize, but we'd also be gentler in certain respects, because we'd be like, okay, look, we know how hard this one is. Yes. But there are also standard ways to break down problems. What's Are there premises? Is it a conclusion? Is it a fact set? What's going on? Let's start with some of the basics that you would if you're breaking down anything. But that is point the way about ultimately yeah, to think about yeah. this thing. I 100% agree with you on that in terms of what's going on with this. So that's always what your goal is. Understand it well enough to teach somebody else. All these review processes, all these analytics that you get, they are all contributing to your ability to do that. They're helping you to understand the problem better than you would understand it if you just did it and never looked at it again. Yeah. And don't forget the end goal, of course, which is if you can start to figure out what went right and wrong before, you can duplicate your success and you can hopefully begin sometimes one chip at a time to whittle down your mistakes. Yeah, you change the things that you don't do well and try to improve them or go out and learn so you get better tools so the next time you can do it faster. That's precisely it. Yeah. Let's cool. get to some fun stuff. I know. Some of this has been pretty uh, broad strokes. <laughs> it has to be because I mean, you have different levels of people. There's some people who are walking into this and they're like, I don't know what to do. Well, now hopefully they have a really good idea. Oh. On the other hand, if you're like, look, I've been studying for a year. I know how to do this. Be like, well, good. Let's make sure that you at least are doing everything the right way. Let's talk now about my favorite part of looking over any student results. And that is, what do the results tell me? Mm. And again, it's not your score sheet. It's the analytics that tell me this. The certain things. And what we'll probably do is just talk through some of the things that we see to give you a sense of how the analytics can help us make very broad stroke judgments and sometimes extremely fine line judgments about performance. But as we get into this, I will give another disclaimer. We're going to talk about things here that probably don't, that certainly don't apply to everybody. Sure. 
everybody is different. So you might hear something about like, well, we saw a trend in RC and you're like, well, I don't have that trend. That's okay. Something else that we talk about will apply to you. If it doesn't, just think about, is there a way that situation could change where it might apply to me? Or is there a different statistic or piece of information that I can draw from this that I could use to analyze my own performance? Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, I think what we're trying to do is give people a sense of what are the things we're looking for and what stands out to us and how some of the stuff that we do is counterintuitive, mm. even. All right. So, some of it's really easy. Like somebody comes in and they're like, I'm really great at, you know, all the LR and the RC, but I got pounded by games. Look, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out, uh, hey, maybe you should focus on that section. <laughs> that's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit there is that's out there. <laughs> so that's, I mean, it, you have to mention it. You do. If if there is something that you are clearly weak at, especially on a section level or broad full test level, go study it. Yeah. If you're not good at games, there's plenty of resources that you can avail yourself of, obviously. We've got the Logic Games Bible and the workbooks and the training types. We've got our courses, tutoring, the forum, even this podcast. We talk about Logic Games a lot. There's plenty of resources just right here that you can access to start helping with that. All right. So uh, an outlier section, uh, an underperformance section, pretty easy. easy. Yeah, that's where you live until you hopefully get it back to where it needs to be. What about someone who's more or less even across the board? You know what? I tend to miss about six everywhere. All right. What does that tell you? It could tell me lots of things. Number one, it would tell me to start with logical reasoning because it counts twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, almost that's a, that's by the way I, a very common mantra. Well, if everything's equal, go LR. Go LR. It's LR. I also think LR is the most um, useful section in terms of a skill set. I think as you get better at something like logical reasoning, it's just almost impossible not to improve in reading comp. And in yeah, a way, it feeds even, into it. Yeah, even in, in logic games, conditional reasoning, for instance, is going to play a role. That kind of thing. So, yeah. to me, LR is, is by far, I think, the most demonstrably helpful skill set. Um, then I think you have to get a little bit more narrow in terms of identifying what caused the problems. I miss six in games, but it's because grouping. Or I miss six in reading comp, but man, it's because I suck at science passages. Or I run out of time. Or this is where a slightly narrower, more molecular type of analysis becomes the distinguishing factor. Yeah, it's not right. just that you were equal in all sections. What caused that equality? Precisely. Yeah. Then it becomes this kind of causal thing. Yeah, you know what? I missed six in both LR sections, but there were the last six questions or whatever. It's six of the last eight. That's different than someone who misses six flaw or parallel yeah. or whatever. So this is where you have to take a, a much more personalized view. I think the, the way I... Th see it as kind of like a pyramid that's upside down. Okay. I start with the, the broadest idea of the test and you're looking at just the overall scaling and then it kind of narrows and narrows and narrows as we go down. Then it goes to each section. Then it goes to a breakdown inside the section, the question position, the types of question yeah. or in games, you know, the type of game or the type of passage and things of that nature. So it gets more and more specific and that's yeah. kind of what we're doing in our discussion here. Talking, starting by like, oh, you had one bad section. That has got to be the most obvious thing that anybody could spot. Right. <laughs> Nobody should be paid for spotting that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'll give you your money back if that's the best I can offer. We'll get to the money ideas. <laughs> <laughs> As you talk about pyramids. Um, the, upside yeah, down ones. Upside down ones. I thought you were going to try to sign me up for something. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> But, you know, you can look inside sections and think, like you mentioned, like the last questions, you missed six, six of eight. Well, what if you miss six of the first 10 questions? Very different. You know, that, is that because of high difficulty? No. It tells me that you're probably careless. You're maybe going too fast and probably rushing, sloppy, uh, yeah, unfocused at the beginning. And this happens. Yeah. You just, yeah, you're, you're not dialed in as the section started. Uh, and this is, again, a tip that I've given people in the past. I do it myself every time. I take two or three seconds. I'm willing to spend it at the outset of every section to just close my eyes and remind myself what my goal is for that section type. What's my time management about to look like? What's my central priority here? 
it's reading comp, how am I going to engage the passages? If it's games, how am I going to tackle them? If it's LR, how am I going to navigate through what I know to be a somewhat predictable landscape? I do that at the beginning of every section. Oh. So and these kinds of things, but I only do that because I'm aware of the risks of missing, say, a couple in the first ten or a sloppy first passage, or what is probably going to be one of the easier two games in the first game or two. Yeah, in logical reasoning, we know that the order of difficulty is not set, right. but on a broad level, the first ten are generally easier than the last ten. It trends. Yeah. yeah, and so when I see things like this, I'm always trying to analyze, well, what happened? Why did you miss some of these so-called easier questions early on? And then you, you talk to the person. Yeah. Well, I was trying to get, you know, I wanted to do one question per minute, so I was rushing. I was like, you're rushing too much. Yeah. Let's slow down next time and see if that makes a little bit of difference. You gave away some gimmies in the same way that if I see somebody perform bad in the first logical reasoning section, but well in the second, I'm like, you weren't ready for LOR or early in the test versus late, or you could flip it. Why did you really fall apart towards the end of this test? Did you get tired? Yeah. You can see that even in an individual section. Somebody misses, say, eight of the last ten questions in logical reasoning. Was it difficulty or was it fatigue? I need to ask questions, and a student needs to ask questions of themselves to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's easy on a, some hand for us to sit here and talk about the ways that we would analyze these things. But, of course, this is about empowering people to do it without us. So these are the questions you need to be asking of yourself. That's exactly right. You just have to think about like every piece of information can be indicative of something larger. At times it's not, but in many instances there are questions to be asked about why things happen. Like you just mentioned that idea of fatigue. If I look at each section of the test and I see that towards the end performance goes down mm -hmm. – and then it really drops as we get into sections, you know, three and four or four and five, depending on how many sections there were. It probably has something to do with getting tired. And maybe the repetitiveness becomes stultifying where you're like, I'm so sick of dealing with this. It becomes boring. Yeah. I had so, a student, a tutoring student of mine last year. Um, and I, I wish I tutored more so I have more stories, but so it goes. Who every test inevitably, regardless of what the first section was, it was going to be her worst section. For a long time, and I would see this over and over in practice tests. And it was clear to me why. She just didn't have her head in the game until about 15 minutes in. And so I started making her do warm-ups. And I would sit there and be like, you start this test in 20 minutes, but until then you do this. And as soon as she did it, it seemed to cure it. I think but it was, it was one of those things, I've probably told you about this student, I won't mention her name, but... As soon as she did it, it completely changed things. Her score jumped like 10 points overnight because she just wasn't giving away questions she would have gotten right otherwise. I think this is a good example of like to us, because we've both had students that way. I think almost any LSAT instructor has had students where the very beginning of the test for them is subpar compared to how they're able to perform on the rest of the test. Mm -hmm. And to us, the answer is so easy. You're not, you're not warmed up. You're not, not ready. ready. Yeah. Your head's not in the game. It's harder when you're a student to be like, gosh, I just struggle with those questions. She and couldn't to, figure it out. Yeah, they, can't, they, they don't necessarily have the experience to realize there is a broader reason that you're struggling. It's not something to do with the difficulty of those questions. It's actually the way your mindset is prepared for this section or unprepared as the case actually yeah. is. Yeah, and I don't I, I hope no one listening to this hears me saying like what an obvious thing for her to overlook. That's not at all what I mean. What I mean is simply the fact to an outside observer it was fairly apparent what was going on. And yet internally she was ready to pull her hair out. Like she had no she couldn't get her head around the idea of I know I can do this, but I'm not. Why? And that's, there's no judgment whatsoever in that from me. If anything, I think it maybe makes the case of sometimes you need outside help. Sometimes you need a second set of eyes on you. Self-analysis is the hardest thing for people to do. It is. There's that great LSAT LR question, actually, about the ability to diagnose your own like mental <laughs> illness. But if you have it, you can't. That kind of, you know what I'm talking you about? You can't. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> the one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and this isn't yeah. mental illness. That's just the, no, this the analog just, I used. That wasn't that. Yeah, that's a, a parallel. If she case. hears this, you're perfectly normal. Well, I mean, think about uh, just as a complete sidebar, <laughs> writing a personal statement. 
I've watched people really struggle with that because they can't they can't turn the lens on themselves successfully. This is do. the same type of thing. And it's easy to think it's this problem that caused me to miss this. It's not always the problem. It can be larger area factors that you have to look at. And that might require you doing warm-up questions. It might require you picking up a book and saying, I really don't understand assumptions. Right. Or I didn't really get these flaws and I need to figure that out. Or I'm running out of gas by the end of the test or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah. there can be systemic or larger scale factors as opposed to it was the way they worded this question or I didn't understand that question stem. Those do play a role. It's just they don't play every single role. Right. So you have to look broader. And if, as you said, John, when we're trying to help people do this on their own, to us, it's natural because we've been doing it for years and we can take in a lot of information related to LSAT performance and be like, okay, it's this, this, and this and start you know, churning out suggestions. It's really hard to do this on your own, so don't get frustrated by it. Just keep working at it and saying, well, why would that be the case? And In that same vein, let's look at some more specific type of problems as sure. opposed to these broader systemic ones. I'll, I'll append to that. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Definitely. Yeah. Or avail yourself of you know, help that's out there. Okay. Try yeah. to, you know, ask questions, try it yourself first, ask questions after. Cause I always appreciate when someone comes to me and says, all right, I looked at this forever and I'm just stuck. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I create, I appreciate the old college try. And then pay me. <laughs> <laughs> pay John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's look at some specific cases. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times with the analytics, one of the things that we see is we like to look at things like question types and reasoning types and game types and so forth. Right. And some of them are really obvious. If somebody's gone out and there were 12 cause and effect questions and they got two of them right, I'm like, I think maybe you need to go look at causality. That's obvious. Again, that's not some kind of like amazing insight. But let me give you an example. Like okay. I had a student come to me earlier this year who was struggling in LR and they were upset about weaken and strengthen questions specifically. And it was related into assumptions as well. And they were getting something like 25 to 30% of those right. And so they were like, I don't understand why I'm not getting this. And I was like, show me the rest of the results here in LR. And I noticed immediately that there must be true percentage was like 45%. Okay. And to them, they're like, that's not the problem. I'm already, I'm doing better in that. This is the real problem, strengthen and weaken. And they were adamant that that was where the issue was. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's not how I saw it at all. I was like, what's really the problem here is, is that you don't know how to identify facts and structure in an argument. Mm -hmm. And that means that when you're then asked to manipulate the argument to strengthen it or weaken it, you're not going to be any good at it because you already didn't know what was happening in the argument. You need to go back and get a higher percentage of must be true questions. That will make you better at weakening and strengthening the argument because you'll have a more solid foundation from which to, you know, make those attacks or yeah. supports as needed. And so that's what they did. They went back and I said, don't worry about anything else right now. Focus on must be true, most strongly supported type of questions for a while. And they started to get back into that and they weren't being rigorous enough. They were not really like locked in on the fact test and they were kind of like letting things slide and using that old thing like, well, probably this will be the case. I'm like, probably equals death and must be true. <laughs> So once they got it up and they were like 75, 80%, I was like, now go back and do some more strength and weaken questions. And magically, they were all, all of a sudden over 50% on those. I'm sure and it I was felt like, magical too. Like, it, I have it, no idea what's happened, but here I am. Suddenly, I'm much better at this. I was like, <laughs> you, you didn't know? have a problem with strengthening and weakening. You had a problem with facts. You didn't know the facts. And that made you bad at everything else at the test. And to be honest, must be true is... Almost always in LR, the first question type that I will look at, because that is the foundation of the test. If you can figure out what must be true, it'll make it a lot easier for you to parallel it, identify the method of reasoning, figure out how to strengthen it, and so on. Describe a flaw, and on and on. You know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but related, um, two points. One, you've just given a perfect example of why sometimes expert help is worth every penny. Two, um, there's a thing I recorded, I don't know if you were part of these videos or not, I know, I'm sure we discussed it, but 
uh, a thing in our online student center, Dave, called question type relationships. You did and that. I didn't. I know I did them, but I, I wasn't sure if you sat in. But I did an entire series. There's two or three of them in there. Three of um, them. Three. Oh. Thanks for reminding me of me. <laughs> <laughs> I know you better than you know yourself. Yeah, it's not that tough. But <laughs> I'm an open book. That's actually hilarious. <laughs> All right, back to it. <laughs> but but yeah, back to it. So I, I did a bunch of these things where I'm like, look, if you're struggling here, put it aside and go do this instead. If you're struggling here, go do this instead. And what you find is exactly what you've just described, is that there are alternative avenues to improvement that are almost impossible to either self-diagnose or, or self-discover. Well, think about that example I just Exactly. Made. I mean, yeah, it's a perfect it, example. It looks like strength and weaken are the problem. They're not the problem. There's an underlying cause that's creating all of that. Yeah. I think, you know, there's other relationships like that that we look at as well that are not necessarily so, you know, basic or like kind of like direct or tangible in the way that a must be true question would be. Right. You know, we won't, do, again, investigate them too much here because that's not the point of this discussion. But the fact that that kind of insight exists to me tells me, number one, again, seek professional help <laughs> when in doubt. <laughs> and two, this test really has a lot to reveal about itself after the fact. And that's what this discussion is. That's exactly right. You know. I think you and I both know the idea that if you look at something that is relatively broad, mm -hmm. it tells us a complete different set of things. Like I think of must be true questions is very concrete. The answer usually is some kind of like rewording of ideas from the stimulus or very directly related to it. Linking of them, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, but I I know that we both look at method and flaw questions as kind of like really one big question type that's all related. And if I see somebody who's gone out and, you know, has gone three right and 10 wrong, well, now I know something different about their performance. They don't, it's not so much the concrete problems. They don't understand structure. Yeah. They don't understand big abstract relationships. And, you know, it's like, well, I'm just not good at flaw. I'm like, well, what is it that you don't know the flaws or maybe it's actually something much deeper than that. Yeah. It could be what? that you don't understand it at a abstract level. Mm -hmm. One of the first places I always look when I see a student's results before I even care about like section by section, I, I look at the families mm -hmm. and I say, how do they do in the families that are proof-based versus argument-based? Because to me, this is a very polarizing moment on the test for people. How they perform on things like assumption and weaken and strengthen versus how they do in things like method and flaw and must parallel. Yeah, and let me just give a, a, a brief explanation of that. In our systems, which as far as I know is completely unique in terms of what we do, and if it's not, it's because somebody else has <laughs> taken inspiration from it. That's a good way to politically put it. <laughs> <laughs> so diplomatic. Because I know that when uh, I first wrote this up, uh, it didn't exist in the world of test prep. But one of the things that we did is we took the underlying ideas – of the various questions and said, look, they're actually really very broadly related. And so like first family for us is like must be true, method of reasoning, flaw in the reasoning, parallel, because they're all fact-based. They relate uh, the stimulus to the answer choices in a perfect downward yeah. direction. They're either fact or structure-based in this sense where it's all coming directly from the stimulus. Second family is a lot of the strength and support assumption stuff. Uh, third family is weak and fourth is, is basically cannot be true. And so the first and fourth are much more direct from the stimulus, whereas the second and third are a lot more argumentation-based. And the answers affect things that you've just read as opposed to following from them. That kind of, yeah. Manipulation as opposed to simply Precisely. following direction. Precisely. And so we immediately will look at the families and say, this tells me something about the way you think and what you need to improve upon. Whereas, at least in my experience, a lot of students don't come to me and say, well, it's a, really, it's a, it's a second family issue. I'm like, it might be, you just don't realize it. Right. So we look at things like that. And of course, our analytics help us with that as well. And we'll help you if you're looking for these things. Oh, yeah. If you know, if you know that each piece of information can be highly informative, Revealing. all of a sudden you'll look at it differently. You'll be like, I'm going to take more note out of it. 
It's it's the same thing like when we look at somebody's performance and we try to link sections together. Like I look at conditional reasoning not just in logical reasoning but in logic games as well mm -hmm. to see how good you are at something like conditional reasoning which we know is tested everywhere or just basic reading. I think we've seen this – we've all seen this before where <laughs> somebody's really good at reading comprehension. Like they're 22 out of 27. And you're like, all right, solid reading comp. And then you look at their logical reasoning and they're like at best 50%. A lot of times they're like, well, I just – I'm struggling with LR. I'm like, you're not struggling with LR. You're struggling with knowing what they want from you. And I know that because I can tell you're a good reader. You don't you, know what they're – yeah. You don't know what you're being asked, but you have the skills to get it right. Yeah. If you can get 22 right in reading comprehension, you've got reading ability. You're just more comfortable in the, in the reading comp scenario. LR is – cutting you to pieces because every single time you turn around, there's a new problem and they're testing something different and you don't know what it is that they're testing. So let's right. focus on that. Yeah. That's the most polite way I've ever heard you call someone literate. <laughs> <laughs> literate but incompetent. <laughs> I just called thieves, you know, inspired. <laughs> right, you did. <laughs> inspired by. It's beautiful. Thieves is, is, is very harsh. Let's say You're being borrowers. delicate tonight. I don't know if I like it. Ah, uh, Yeah. Borrowers. New decade, new Dave. This is the last podcast of this decade. <laughs> I'd say it's been a good decade. Yeah, it's been all right. Yeah, I'll take it. I'd do it again. Well, we both made it through from the looks of things. So, Dude, there's still like 24 hours again, here. Yeah, see, against all odds and certainly against all smart bets. We're 30 hours away from the end of the decade. Let me just make it there first. I told you my mom said that on every birthday of the last like 12 years. She's called me and been like, we never thought you'd make it this far. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. Oh, your mom. She's a sweet Love heart. you, Debbie. Yeah, she's the best. Anyway, back to it. Um, I, I take your point. There's so much to be translated or, or learned out of the, uh, the output of these things, which is really where we're going. And yeah, these I mean, specific scenarios, I think, show just how unique or, or subjective, in a way, some of this can be. Yeah, you and I both have seen this, whether it's between sections or inside of a section. Mm -hmm. You know, in logic games, I think I heard you say the other day, you were, you were talking to somebody about local versus global questions. Sure. I mean, we talked about it in the last podcast, even, where I was like, these questions have different things to to show you, to teach you, to reveal about the game and about your understanding of it. As we did the November breakdown in the last discussion, I was like, I jump around a lot because the questions themselves teach me things. And certainly how the questions, the results of my performance there would teach me things. Yeah. Like I don't know for if that's exactly what you're talking about. But it is. It is really what I'm talking about. But even like a lot of times I think when students look at logic games, they're like this game. Right. And I'll go into the whole section. I'll be like, well, let's look at all your local versus global questions. And sometimes it's like there's nothing there. Like it's not informative. That happens plenty of times. But every once in a while I'll see somebody who's like, boy, you're getting every local question right, but you're missing a whole bunch of global questions. Mm -hmm. What's happening? And that question doesn't get asked. Usually they're like, well, I'm just good when they give me that. I'm like, yes, you are. But it also means that you aren't spending enough time in the setup yeah. to understand how the game's working overall. But guess what? You're really good when they start throwing individual pieces at you. Yeah. You have an incomplete understanding of the mechanics, but you can at least react to a specific. Yeah. Which but tells me one of two things. Number one, you either need to spend more time to get that bigger picture understanding or if you've done that and you've found that you can't, maybe you need to go to a more hypothetical-based approach mm -hmm. in games where you're like, all right, I'm going to focus on a, local, a lot of local scenarios because I'm apparently pretty good at that. Are you suggesting they sketch hypotheticals themselves? Like it might be. Draw a random template just to see how the, the pieces operate, the architecture itself. If they're showing themselves to be really good at manipulating the actual pieces but not understanding the bigger picture connections, yeah, that might be a good way to go forward. Maybe they you. could shift to starting to do more of that. Yeah. That's the kind of things, I mean, honestly, that people pay us for where they're like, oh, <laughs> that changed how I was doing and I added four more questions, correct, in a section, yeah. which we then know later on turns into a higher LSAT score, which then turns into a better financial offer. Yeah. That's how this whole thing yeah. works. So, And that's when we pay them back. So uh, <laughs> um, you're really on the money today. Thanks. The end of the year has really got you money focused. Yeah, man. It's almost tax season. I uh, I have. I'm just. I had a very generous Christmas and 
I'm feeling it. I um, <laughs> one of the things I recommend to people do in games and in reading comp and really everywhere is time themselves as they move through a section very uh, distinctly. So very piece by piece. Don't just say, oh, that game took me nine minutes. How long did your setup take you before you moved to the first question? Was there a question in there that took you three minutes? How long did you spend reading passage to before you moved into its questions? These are moments of import, frankly. You have to know how it is that you're interacting with the test at this level. And I, again, I think a lot of people look at this. You said forest for trees. It's exactly right. People see a broad landscape, and I'm like, no, no, no. Look at that shrub. Like, what it, What's happening right now? What happened in the last minute and a half? That's what you need to know. And Where you can rank questions as part of blind review, et cetera. Flag questions is difficult, and so on. It's you interacting with the test, and that tells you a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. And then what the results tell you about your performance then feeds back into this loop that allows you to learn more and more about the decisions that you made, the patterns that you've fallen into, the types of things that you tend to get right and that you tend to miss. And, you know, in the last 10 minutes or so, we've talked about some really specific scenarios. And there are dozens and dozens of these that we could go through where we can break it down and be like, well, that tells me this, this tells me that. And at a certain point, it just becomes overwhelming. So as a person taking the test out there, you have to say, let me look at everything that's notable. Even getting 100% on something is useful, uh, or maybe it's not. What if it's an evaluate the argument question, and there was only oh, one of them, yeah, and you got 100% on it? I'm Yay. so good at formal logic. Well, yeah, there was congrats. only one question or right. two questions of formal logic. That 100% isn't the most important thing, whereas there were 12 must-be-true questions, and you went eight and four on those. Now you're talking about prioritization. Yes, like, I think something near and dear to your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Life is a constant struggle of uh, risk reward, right? Or and investment and payoff, however you want to look at it. <laughs> and death. And death. <laughs> and taxes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just what am I putting into this test or what is this test giving me? And then how do I determine where my attention needs to immediately uh, divert? Because again, if it's flaw in the reasoning versus evaluate the argument, it's an obvious choice. If yeah, it's grouping games flaw. versus pattern, it's an obvious choice. And I think that's this is a good kind of like close to the end point to make is that your prioritization has to be on the biggest, most tested pieces. Earlier, you're like, well, if you're kind of even in all sections, start with LR because that's 50% of the test. There's a lot more flaw questions than evaluate. Work on flaw. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. There's a lot more grouping games than there are pattern games. Work on grouping. Same thing with linearity. Sure. So you prioritize and then use these feedback loops to figure out how to get better. If I can get, you know, a little better on something that's tested a lot, a lot that's going to have a, a really big effect. Yeah. No, I'm completely with you. Look, envy the person whose biggest issue is evaluate or pattern games or circularity or something. Like, goodness, to be in your shoes, you lucky devil. <laughs> you have very few problems in life if that's your issue at that point, at least LSAT life. That's right. Yeah. Welcome to the podium. So at that point, that's where someone would hope to be. But you have to kind of climb your way to there. And so make sure you're checking the big boxes before you get hung up on the smaller ones. I'd agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you didn't, this will be I think our last that, podcast. I think that kind of like closes us out in terms of that discussion of, of like the things to look for. Hopefully what this has done is provided a lens that you can view your practice test results through. Like how should I be reviewing exams? Then what do those results actually tell me? To, again, I cannot stress enough the idea that if you miss questions, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Learn from them. The biggest crime is to miss something and then not learn anything from it. That I cannot abide by. But if you miss a bunch of questions and then you say, all right, I'm not going to miss that type of question again because I learned this, that's what proper preparation is. It's a long, hard road at times, but at least it's a road where you're moving forward. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I'd, I'd add to that, Dave, that I think about the worst thing that could happen to anyone preparing for this test is that they accidentally get things right. <laughs> they stumble into correctness. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. If if you should have missed it and don't, that's a tragedy because it tells you nothing. Well, it actually I mean, unless... blindfolds you. Yeah. It makes you think that you're better than you really are and sets you up to get nailed. That's one of the things that blind review helps with. And that's why I always recommend do at least a few tests that way to see how it works and to get comfortable with it and to make sure that you're not having a couple lucky spells. The other, I think, kind of like, I'm not going to say necessarily tragic, but dangerous situation to me is when somebody runs into a situation where they can't figure out what it is that they're looking at, or they're not really sure. And then they end up just doing test after test, staring at the results and getting frustrated. Yeah. There's been a wave of this on various forums that I've seen um, where people are like, I'm done with the LSAT. I'm sick of studying for it. I'm not getting anywhere. And I always say the same thing. It's like, look, there are a lot of places you can get information, but sometimes you do need to you know, step back and be like, I, mean, I can talk to a tutor for a couple hours. Yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, you have a conversation with somebody like myself or John, and we're looking specifically at your results and you have our attention, we're usually going to be able to say, I would focus on this, this, and this, prioritize this and that, and then start here. That's incredibly valuable, even it, not just because it can like move you up to another level or another, you know, get you out of the plateau you're in, because it also breaks you out of that mindset, which is like a death spiral where you're like, I hate this test. I don't want to do it anymore. Don't just sit in stew. If you really want to go to law school, there are many tools out there that you can access. You simply have to go seek them. So it's kind of like my two cents. Sometimes it's free. Sometimes as John wants, he wants the cash money. <laughs> I do feel a bit mercenary at the moment. <laughs> you really do. Usually we don't really do a lot of self-promotional uh, stuff that we do. Uh, every once in a while, though, I think it's justified. And this is a good sure. example. This is, to me, one of the hardest things is to self-analyze. That's why I mentioned personal statements before. I have worked with so many people where I'm like, I could have made your personal statement better yeah. if you'd shown it to me before you, <laughs> you know, you submitted it. Or if you'd worked with somebody and, and you know, does admissions counseling with us because they've seen it and they know all the mistakes to avoid. So, yeah, same this, type of thing. I, the reason that maybe I'm leaning harder into it this time than I normally would is just because I know what we're talking about right now is essentially the cornerstone of improving or not. Do yeah. you know why you're struggling? Do you know why this test is kicking your ass a little bit? Because if you do and you have the right kind of guidance, it won't continue to you will get better and it's hard to even put an amount of cash to the value of that and that's why I, I just don't want anybody to be out there feeling like well i'm stuck and i can't do it on my own you don't have to be on your own not when it comes to this this is too important i got a message from a student today and she said thank you so much for convincing me to retake this test <laughs> i just got into columbia today Wonderful. in fact i'll post it on my twitter do it. Uh, tomorrow about the time this comes out because it's one of my I love getting messages like this where it's like, it's not just that I got into a law school that I wanted to get into, it's that you helped me with that. And that is so gratifying to me personally, and I know to us as a company, uh, to get those kinds of messages because it makes me feel like, hey, I had a really positive effect on that person's life. And really, there's nothing better than that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I hadn't seen that message, but I'm looking forward mm. to it. I, I get, told you I get about enough it. of them that I know more or less. She was super stoked. And then I, I was looking at... The stuff we'd been talking about, and I'd been very strong about, you need to go redo this again. And that's just something like retake the test. Imagine what we can do with specifics. Yeah. That's so, amazing. All right. Any final thoughts, or was that your final thought? I think that was my final thought. Yeah, man. Happy New Year, buddy. That's Happy my final, New Year. That's my final thought. 2020, 2020 is, is coming. 2020 is going to be a good one. 2019 is one of the most unusual LSAT years in history. Probably... The bumpiest ride that I have ever seen from that organization called LSAC in Newtown. I am certain that they are thrilled to death that this year is over. They have had perhaps the worst, the worst performance in test company history, I would say. In all of standardized test prep? Yep. Not prep. Just standardized oh, no, no, not test prep, making. Sorry, yeah, administration, standardized test administration. And that's saying something because the college board has had some pretty bad years uh, in, in recent memory. So yeah. I would have to say this is the worst I've ever seen out of a performance of a company. I know that they're happy that it's over. I'm hoping for their sake that they kill it in 2020, make our lives a lot easier. I hope your life's a lot easier in 2020 as well. Smooth sailing. 
Um, smooth sailing, smooth man. Sailing, brother. Yeah, feeling good. All right, all right. Buddy. Well, well, I'm gonna ring it in. This is a good one to close out. You're on. in Nevada. Nevada. <laughs> yeah, dude. Go find yourself a hot tub or a bottle of brandy. No, I'm pretty sure the <laughs> no. family's like, are you going to join us for dinner at some point I here? Know. I'm like, yeah. I know, I'm keeping you from dinner. All right, buddy. All right. I love you. I'll see you soon. You got it, buddy. On our behalf, thanks to everybody for listening this year. We're really looking forward to 2020. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the wide world. Give us a rating and send us any questions you might have to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. Good luck to everybody this week. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.